Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Later on in the show, we're going to talk, uh, it's Style Week after all, so we're going to talk to an up and coming local jewelry designer, the Lauren Hope jewelry line, made right here in Rhode Island. But right now, I'm very pleased to be joined by Kurt Harrington, the CEO <laughs> of Something Fishy and a friend of his. Who are we looking at here, Kurt? This is uh, an, one of our placat vases. Placat is Thai for the fighting fish, which is what we have in here. And they are natively from small puddles of water in Thailand. So now I see he's he's kind of hiding from uh, what our viewers can <laughs> see there. Let me. I'm going to try to spin it just a little bit without. Nope. Don't swim. Come on. You can do it. Nope. He's we, staying where he we, wants if, to be. If you pet him, sometimes. Oh, he'll, all right. He'll, he'll, he'll there around, we go. So. <laughs> now we're seeing him. Okay. So um, and this is your line of work. Something fishy. Fish. The world. The business of fish, Kurt. So. Give people, it's, it, this is obviously a very small version of what you do. Give people a sense. What do you do with something fishy? Thanks, Ted. Uh, so we believe aquariums move people in amazing ways. So what we do is different for our clients based on their needs. So whether it's a nursing home that needs to reduce anxiety to keep wheelchair residents in their chairs and not anxious to want to get up, which can create a fall. Uh, in, a, in a nursing home, we reduce anxiety. In a doctor's office, we reduce the white coat syndrome. In your home, we create energy, collaboration, great family conversation, and provide a screen that your kids would want to look at and you'd want them to look at more than any TV or video game. So you are making the designs then. You're, not, you're, you're doing everything from figuring out how big the aquarium is to getting the fish in there and, and sending people to clean it sometimes. Absolutely. So our work starts early on from a conversation with our clients, whether you're going to have something as small as our placat line to as large as something you could dive in and at that point we'd be working with architects but the norm is certainly having an aquarium that would be very fitting for your living room. Now you've been at this quite a number of years now. How big an enterprise has uh, something fishy grown into? So we started when I was a 15 year old kid and I was cleaning fish tanks while in high school and today I'm 36 and we've grown we have 12 employees we're located in Warwick Rhode Island and we service the Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts area. So um, you have the store down on Jefferson Boulevard, but you also spend a lot of time going all over, right, to your clients and everything. How far afield uh, have you built aquariums or are you servicing aquariums at this point? Our, our showroom in Warwick is really there to be able to provide a kind of a, a place to hang our hat, if you will, for our, our employees our, to meet our customers. We do unique things there. So next week we're having a pop-up dinner where a chef's coming in and cooking dinner uh, and it's a, it's a $50 meal, a five course meal. Is he making fish? And, and he's, he, there is some fish on the menu. <laughs> uh, and uh, what'll happen is, is we're using that venue because it's really cool the way we set it up as, as a place to, to bring people and have camaraderie around our, our clients. But most of our customers and clients actually don't come to our showroom. Uh, we, we do a lot by going out to them. So for example, Google's a client. We started working with the architect in Boston in their location and they've never even been to, to our showroom here uh, or down the road in Warwick. They found you and you went up there and you took care of them. Yes. So you, you actually announced this week, part of what I wanted to have you on now, is a, a partnership with Jordan's Furniture to start offering, a, we see some of their aquarium furniture. Now, how is this gonna work? What is this, what are we looking at here as we, as we see it there? Well, as you know, Jordan's Furniture, and specifically Elliot, is all about the experience that happens within, while you're shopping for furniture. So I propose to Elliot that why don't we allow your customers to bring the experience home? So we infused aquariums into, into furniture lines that are, that are much more nicer pieces, elegant pieces of furniture without going custom, without going extravagant from a price standpoint, to be able to have in your home that you're not gonna be able to find in the marketplace today. So we, uh, 36 months ago, uh, we started working with Elliot and his team at Jordan's Furniture, and we've come up with a complete product line, as you've shown, that includes aquariums that are gonna be excellent additions to the living room, the bathroom, it could be in the kitchen, any room in the house, a study. Now, when's it gonna start rolling out? Where will people be able to find these? So the launch uh, announcement is actually tonight at our showroom in Warwick, and then we will actually hit Jordan's showrooms uh, starting on March 3rd with the Reading location, and then the following stores will be coming in the, in the coming months. It's gonna be in the Warwick store, even though you guys are nearby? We are gonna be in the Warwick store, but we're not launching there because the, the first store we wanted to go into is their, their largest operation, which is Reading, Massachusetts. So it, this is interesting. So who are your, you mentioned Google, for example. Who are some of your other customers people might recognize that you've done this work for? 
Well, a great partner that we have in customer is Mystic Aquarium. What's fun about Mystic is obviously it's a great destination point for all of us here in Rhode Island and the surrounding states. But more than that, I volunteer there as a 17-year-old kid, <laughs> having, obviously having a passion for fish. So uh, having them as a client today where we can support their exhibit development, design, and execution against that is really great. Uh, in addition to that... It, now, let me keep you on Mystic for a sec. I would assume that Mystic had some expertise in fish even before you started your company. So where did you fit into their plans at Mystic? Mystic has excellent expertise, obviously, around all their husbandry and their exhibit work and their care for their animals, including veterinarian staff and all that is needed for that. Really, the element that we added to that was looking creatively outside of the box. Our company designs aquarium exhibits for homes and has technicians going into those homes on a regular reoccurring basis. So putting efficiencies in line with that is very important. If we can look at building an exhibit that's more efficient to take care of, we're a lot more effective as a company. And an institution like Mystic Aquarium, that's obviously important, but not necessarily driven to the extent that we drive it as a for-profit company. So we uh, collaborated with them on that aspect, making exhibits more efficient. The other thing is we really bring more of an eye for design to the exhibit so that the guest experience, it is a, all about the fish, but you want to make that guest experience that's around the exhibit. You want to have a little bit more interaction with it. So I'll give you an example. There's, they have a sea turtle rescue program. And the sea turtles, you can't have any decor in the aquarium. So obviously the sea turtle is quite an attraction, but there's nothing around the surrounding the sea turtles. So we built a sand castle encapsulating the fish tank and the kids can crawl in the sand castle, put their, their noses up to the, to the tank and look through a mask to look at the sea turtles. So we really bought, brought the decor outside. Obviously the sea turtles being from the ocean and having a sand castle next to it, it's just, it was one thing that we did to be more interactive. That is fascinating. All right, we're gonna talk more. We have to take a break, but we're gonna talk more with Kurt about something fishy and what else is going on there, as well as his interaction with the Speaker of the House last week. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Now, later on in the show, we're going to hear, it's Style Week after all, so we're going to hear from an up-and-coming local jewelry designer, the uh, woman behind the Lauren Hope line of jewelry, and how jewelry is still thriving in Rhode Island, she says, more than we might realize. But right now, very, be, very pleased to be joined by Kurt Harrington and his friend, The Fish, because he is the CEO of Something Fishy out of Warwick. And you see, there's our friend. And now, the fish is very still, but it, we keep checking. The fish is not dead. <laughs> this, fish, this is just what they do, right? They hang out? Yeah, these are beta fish, also known as fighting fish. So they do like very still environments, but they, uh, they're they very motivated, and uh, he's very healthy and fine. <laughs> he's fine. So no wor don't worry at home, folks, about our, our friend the fish. He's just taking in this fascinating interview, I'm sure. So um, I want to ask about you personally, uh, Kurt. Why aquariums? How did you get into this? How Did, did you always love fish? I, I think uh, you find your passion and you never work another day in your life. So thank you, Mom, for buying me a fish at the age of eight. And, uh, and you just was, loved it immediately? It was, it was a goldfish in about a half a gallon of water. <laughs> By the time I was 15, we, my twin brother and I, Donnie, had four or five fish tanks in our parents' home. And that was it. I mean, we were, we were hooked. And uh, from there, we just, they were all freshwater aquariums. You know, the, the drive back then was, let's do saltwater. It's going to be cooler and more fun. Yeah. So that's really where the passion started. It was a true hobby of mine and still is and to this day. And you, you mentioned earlier, you started doing this at a very young age. You were 15. How did you initially switch from just liking your pet fish at home to saying, I could, this could be a business too? I wish I could take the credit for it. My twin brother, Donnie, said to me one day, hey, let's uh, clean fish tanks for people. We were 15 years old at the time. And, and of course, I had already had the lemonade stand, the paper route, and uh, I said, that's a great idea. So I made up some business cards along with my brother. We posted them at the local pet store, and we got a client. Our first client was my dentist, Dr. Anthony DeMeo in Westerly. The only problem is we couldn't figure out how to get there because we were 15 and didn't have a driver's <laughs> license. Thanks again to mom and dad for, uh, for transporting us. Uh, once a month, we'd go clean his fish tank for $12. And then, and then it just grew from there. And then it became an, uh, a concept of earning enough money in high school so that I wouldn't have to work in college. And oh, okay. my senior year in high school, I earned $50,000 cleaning fish tanks. 
Wow. So you're, we were talking here before the break about uh, some of your clients, Google, Mystic Aquarium. I know you also did uh, worked on Foxwoods. I mean, how much, we, we've all seen in, in major office buildings that have these sorts of things, these very big aquarium uh, things put together for unrelated businesses. How much money do people shell out for those kinds? Well, certainly, we all like to talk about the, the big, larger jobs that we do, and I would add Yale New Haven Hospital into the mix. And clients like that can spend 50 or 100,000 or more on aquariums. And we do a lot of work like that, but that's really not the core business. Our core business, and in, in order for us to grow a, th a thriving, successful, sustainable company, we've really added um, aquariums from this, this uh, tabletop accessory for $50 to your, you know, your starting point to have a nice piece of furniture and aquarium in your home is 1000 or $2,000. And if you have a 2000 to $10,000 budget, you're gonna have something really nice. Over 10,000, you can start to get into some of the custom things that we do. In, in walls. The, to maintain an exhibit like that, and our company offers a service where we come in on a regular basis, and this is the key to our customers being successful, our service programs start at $260 for uh, one month, and we come out twice during that period, take care of the aquarium, provide all the services that are needed. Our consumers don't do anything at all other than exciting daily feedings. Now, you also, I think you put one in Nicholas Cage's house, right? We did a huge <laughs> project for Big the- one for the property that Nicolas Cage owned. It was actually for the Levins, which were the previous owners. And then during Nicolas Cage's, uh, when he lived in Middletown, we actually managed that for him uh, while he was so there. So he kept it going. So he kept it going, absolutely. <laughs> so I saw you just last week, you were at the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce event. You were one of the uh, lucky business owners who got to ask some pointed questions to the lawmakers. Your pitch to Speaker Matty Ellen and the others was get rid of Rhode Island's $500 minimum corporate tax. Why was that top of mind to you? Ned, I think it's really important that Rhode Island supports small businesses. We're between two huge cities with Boston and New York right on our coattails. And Rhode Island is a gem. This is a great place to do business. We do need to make it a little bit easier. I, even in my well-established company, we're always looking at every dollar and how we can invest and grow. Launching an innovative partnership with Jordans, for example, was we invested a tremendous amount of money into that so that we can grow, hire more employees. When we then get a, a, a an annual bill from the state for $500, which is a minimum corporate tax, even if we're not profitable that year, that hurts. That's $500 that could be reinvested in our company, and our reinvestment into our own company will have a much greater payback to the state around. And that was my point. And more specifically, I, I really pointed it towards startup companies. So companies that aren't like mine, but just getting started, we have, co we have kids starting businesses in college dorms, business incubators, garages, and the first thing that they're going to get as a way of, of incorporating their company, in January, you're going to see that $500 uh, tax from the state. And I just think that we can, as a state, be more supportive of small businesses and startups. So um, I, we're running out of time here, but I've got to ask, what's your vision for, for the company? Do you, see, do you see a lot of opportunity for growth still for something fishy? We are in an untapped market. We're creating a market. There's, there's about 16 million aquariums in the United States. Our market is all the consumers that don't have those the doctor's office, medical spaces, there are a number of clients, uh, unlimited number of clients that we, uh, we can enter into partnerships with. So it's unlimited. We're looking at growing to 30 locations by the year 2020. And before we go, any advice to people? A lot of people have their own fish tanks at home. Any, any basic advice or things you see people doing wrong a lot in their fish tanks? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you want to get it done right the first time. Whether you do it on your own and use a company like us to educate you on how to do that or you hire it done, either way, do it right the first time and don't skip on any important piece of equipment. That's something that's really important. Unfortunately, there's a lot of advice on the internet and in the local smaller stores that may not be accurate and it really gets our customer starting off on the wrong foot. Start off right and a tank can be easy to maintain. All right, Kurt Harrington from Something Fishy. You can find them in Warwick and soon at Jordan's. Thank you so much for being with me. Don't go away though, because when we come back, we're gonna talk to the designer of the Lauren Hope jewelry line here in Rhode Island. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi here chatting about possible pronunciations of my guest's last name. We're going to go with Lauren Barham. She is the co-founder and designer of Lauren Hope Jewelry. You see it around us. You see on the mannequin behind her and right here. And uh, getting some attention, actually. You may have seen recently in the Providence Journal, they did a big 
feature on Lauren Hope and the jewelry they did. You see it right there, a new Rhode Island gem talking about uh, what they're doing there. So Lauren, thank you for being with me. Thanks for having me. Now, I have to admit, full disclosure, I am not an expert on jewelry. I know it matters. My girlfriend <laughs> has made that clear to me, but uh, I'm not an expert. So how would you describe the type of jewelry you make and what makes it special? Okay, so I we produce costume jewelry, which costume jewelry is it's also called fashion jewelry, but it's basically jewelry that's not fine jewelry. So fine jewelry would be precious metals like gold, platinum, sterling. Fashion jewelry you can have a little bit of fun with because it fits in a lower price point and you can get a little creative and... A lot of color, yeah, it seems like. Yeah, lots of color. You can play with scale. Um, it's, it's gotten really popular with, with fashion these days just because the price of gold has gone so high. Um, so we construct pieces that are made mostly out of uh, raw brass and then they're electroplated uh, so they could be plated in gold or silver but that's basically what fashion What inspires is. your jewelry? How did you get into this? Um, I think it was meant to be. I've just always loved jewelry since I was a little girl. I have this picture that my mom took of me when I was like four years old with this big rhinestone necklace that I just had to have at a yard sale with my grandmother. <laughs> It's funny because I'm in like pajamas with this big rhinestone necklace. I think I've just always been a magpie and like loved sparkly things. I think, I mean, most little girls do. Right. And then they grow up to, to love jewels too. Um, but yeah, so I've just, I've always loved jewelry and um, all throughout school, like high school, um, college, I've been doing art and it just kind of naturally fell into place. You, um, you've talked about you have a certain kind of woman in mind, the Lauren Hope girl, you called it in some of your uh, statements about the jewelry. When you make your jewelry, who is she? Who is the Lauren Hope girl in your mind? I think, honestly, the Lauren Hope girl is kind of like the person that I aspire to be. She's creative, she's curious, she travels, she's a romantic at heart, she loves history, she's fashion forward, she loves a good story. I that think kind that's, of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so how, tell me the origin story of the company. As you said, you love jewelry at a young age, but there's a big gap between saying, this is shiny, and saying, I'm going to make this exactly. and sell it. So how did that Very happen? Very true. Yeah, so I, um, I went to ECU with East Carolina University. I'm a North Carolina native, um, and I took some metalsmithing classes there, and I just fell in love with working with metal. And um, after I got married, I moved overseas with my husband who was in the Air Force. So he was stationed in England and I started ordering beads and like jewelry uh, components and having them shipped to our APO address and would just like bead at my dining room table. And I had this light bulb moment like, wait, I could sell these and then I could make a little bit of money and I could be creative, like it's time to get in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Lauren Hope was born from that and that was about 10 years ago. And you moved the company from North Carolina, where you're from, as you said, to Rhode yep. Island in 2013. We always hear about companies leaving Rhode Island, not often coming here. Why did you make that decision? You had no connection to Rhode Island, right? Um, well, I was ordering some parts from Rhode Island, and when I would research for new components, because I am a sourcing fanatic, I love like finding new parts, new components for pieces, I noticed that Rhode Island kept coming up in my searches, and we started actually making some pieces in Rhode Island and then I started flying to Rhode Island maybe twice a year and when my husband and I drove up here uh, for a week in 2013 in the beginning it was January um, we just we saw how everything for jewelry making was all right here and you could tell that it was something that had been here for a while and that the people here really knew how to make jewelry and it was like I mean it was just a whole new world. And that'll surprise people who think the jewelry industry died in Rhode Island, past tense, it's gone, it's closed, yeah. it's too bad, but it's over. That was not your experience, right? You found craftsmen and people like that all over the place. Yeah, it's true. I mean, most of the companies that we found, they're mom and pop companies. Their, their grandfather owned it, and then they taught their son, and then they taught their son, and it's a multi-generational thing, and it's usually family businesses, maybe two to five employees. But yes, there are still plenty of skilled craftspeople that know how to produce jewelry You here said there was Island. a 93-year-old man you told the Providence Journal who, who made, uh, I think, some of your clasps. Yes. He's still yes. working. Yes, he's still <laughs> in an old mill in Providence. His daughter, his daughter works there too, and I think she's 73. And just the fact that they're still there and they're still doing what they love and working with the machinery, I don't know, it's just so, in, in fa I'm infatuated That's with it. That's a great it. story. So um, you've gotten national attention for your jewelry. I have to imagine it's difficult. The fashion world, very competitive. There are a ton of people there. How have you, how have you stood out from the crowd? How have you managed that? 
Honestly, I, I mean, I love art so much that I try to just bring forward designs that feel really interesting and new, something that you haven't seen before. Um, I try to reinterpret, I mean, I think, I think our culture kind of has uh, an obsession with olden days and antiques and everything, and I love vintage jewelry, so I try to kind of recreate the look of vintage jewelry, but with a modern sensibility, and I don't know, I just, I try to make it relevant for the modern woman. And it has and an appeal. Yeah. yeah. Where, um, where can people find your jewelry in, in Rhode Island, this area? Is it sold around here? Um, we actually, we're going to be in the Pink Pineapple in Portsmouth and in Newport um, starting in the spring with our new spring line. So we're really excited to have a presence here in Rhode Island. Um, we also have an e-commerce site, which is laurenhope.com, and everything ships out of our East Greenwich headquarters. And another thing might surprise people, it's you're making all the jewelry in Rhode Island, right? You're not making yes. any of it in China at this point or anywhere else right no. now? No. Why is that? I assume it would be cheaper if you sent it overseas. It would, but I just, I love Rhode Island. I love being able to go and visit the people that are making our things. I, I like being able to interact with everyone, and I just think that it's the right thing to do to keep the money circulating in the local economy. And are there ways you've been able to hold down costs while staying in the U.S.? Have you, have you, do you have any brilliant tricks you've found to make it affordable? Um, I think just time management is what's important. As the business has been growing, you start noticing that like a few minutes here and there can add up to hours over time. And so it's just really important to like to watch efficiency and come up with systems that that keep your business moving forward and keep it efficient. And when things aren't working, ask yourself why and then come up with a solution and see if it works. If it doesn't, then try something else. But just always try to keep moving forward and keep efficiency. So we're in a new year, 2015. You're getting already getting some attention uh, in the media, people taking notice. What are you excited about uh, this year for Lauren Hope and your jewelry? Um, I don't know. It, all, it feels amazing, like a dream come true, honestly. Um, I, I'm hoping to do a bridal line. I think that it's a really natural fit for, for our line. Um, we've had some brides wearing Lauren Hope already. So that's one thing I'm really excited about. Um, I'm just really excited about coming out with new product and, and dressing more women <laughs> in our jewelry. And it's clear you're just <laughs> elated by the success of it. Was there a moment when you realized this is gonna work, this is gonna be a hit, I think? Um, it's all happened really fast, to be honest with you, but there was a moment when we were, I was in my old studio and everyone had gone home for the day and I looked around and I just, all of a sudden it hit me, I was like, I'm a real jewelry designer. Like there's stones everywhere and there's a soldering bench over there and there's all this old jewelry sitting over here for reference points and books and it just, it, it, I had just a moment where I felt like, you know, I'm a, I'm a real jewelry designer. And we only have about 30 seconds left, but yep. uh, so has your experience made you optimistic for the Rhode Island jewelry industry more generally? Do you think it, it has a future? I do. I think that overall people are really starting to pay attention to where things come from. We're seeing it a lot with the food movement, with people wanting to buy local, and I think it's going to move over into fashion as well, and I think more and more people are going to support American Made. All right, Lauren Barnum, co-founder and designer of Lauren Hope Jewelry. You see it here. You can find it online and, and in stores locally before you know it. So uh, thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you. And uh, be sure to tune in next week when our guests will be from the Cherry Stone Angel Group talking about some of their investments they're making in startup companies. Mm -hmm. Remember, you can always catch every episode of Executive Suite on WPRI.com. See you back here next week. <laughs>